Okay, so um, hello everyone and welcome to this event. Um, this is the latest in the uh, event series called Show and Tell. Um, that series has um, happened a few times before um, and they are development workshops aimed at PhD students and early career researchers. Um, the previous events in this series have been hosted by the Center for Technology Enhanced Learning and for the first time in a new innovation, um, this event is being jointly held by the Center for Technology Enhanced Learning and the Center for Social Justice and Wellbeing in Education uh, in the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster. Um, the topic of today's session is writing op-ed pieces for public engagement, which is an increasingly important thing that many um, academics and PhD students are being asked to do. And we are lucky to have two speakers who have both got quite a bit of experience in doing exactly that. So um, the two speakers, one is associated with the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning and the other with the Centre for Social Justice and Wellbeing in Education. Um, the first speaker is Kyungmi Lee, um, who is co-director of the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning. Kyungmi works at the intersection of online education, higher education and international education. And Kyungmi has recently had pieces published in the Conversation and Research Professional News. Um, Melis Sin is co-director of the Centre for Social Justice and Wellbeing in Education. Melis is a feminist researcher focused on education and international development. And Melis has recently written also for Research Professional News, as well as Kosh University Gender Studies Center and Perspective on Online. So we're very happy to um, have both of them speaking to us today. Before we invite them to speak, I'll just handle a couple of what we might call the housekeeping um, issues. So this session is being recorded. And the idea is that an edited version of the recording will later appear on YouTube. Um, so there are a couple of things to say. The first is if you really don't want to appear in the recording, you're still welcome to participate in the session, but you might want to turn off your webcam. And if you want to ask a question, then you might want to type it in the chat, which won't be visible on the YouTube recording. And um, so I can read it out for you. There's likely to be some breakout sessions. Those won't appear on the recording. But if in your group, you decide to choose somebody to feed back to the wider group, that might be someone who's happy to be recorded. So just bear in mind um, things like that. There are also a couple of things which are fairly standard for most Zoom meetings, but it's worth saying anyway. So um, we're very happy for you to have your uh, webcam turned on. We don't have a particular problem with that. But if you're not speaking, then it's a good idea to mute your microphone because otherwise we can get lots of strange feedback effects uh, kind of going between people in the meeting. We'd like to avoid that if possible. Um, so unless anyone has any um, particular questions, and if so, please post them in the chat, which I'm opening now, then um, I'm happy for us to begin. And can we and Melis, over to you. Um, thank you, Brett. Thanks a lot. Um, so we'll start. Yes, thank you, Kyungmi. Welcome all. We're very excited to, to host you today as a as Brett has has outlined, um, it's, a, it's a joint event and we'll today talk about our experiences of writing for public engagement. Um, to start with, can I have the next slide, Kimmy? And so to start with, let's discuss why we need to write for public engagement. I understand that most of you are um, early career researchers or PhD researchers who are sort of um, really busy writing out their thesis, your thesis. And you may, you may not necessarily think that, you know, you need to write for public engagement or it may not be your agenda yet because you may be very busy analyzing your data, writing up your thesis chapters, dissertation chapters. So I just want to ask you, and, and since we're not, we're not, it's not a, you know, we don't have so many people, um, maybe some of you can just tell me, you know, like, why do you think we need to write for public engagement? Any ideas out there? So maybe I can just get a couple of responses from, from some of you, if you have a, if you have anything to, to chip in or say. Um, you can just unmute yourself to speak. Yeah, 
Yeah, Sejin, yes, we can reach more people, definitely, definitely. Um, any comments? Yeah, to get feedback from a wider audience, amazing. Melis, it will also be about trying to engage people so that more movement is made to make a difference. Exactly, yeah, that's a, that's, that's the, that's a very, very well it's reason as well. And what else? I'll just get one more response and then we'll just move on if anyone wants to say. <laughs> because funders requires it. Yes, actually, Julianne, you're so right. The funders, most of the time, our funders <laughs> requires it as well that we we um, we do have public engagement. So um, I definitely agree with the all reasons that you have outlined. So we write to disseminate our fine findings with public. Um, and sometimes we write to shape our research agenda, um, sometimes to, to develop our, um, you know, like methodologies. I mean, it's not, I mean, writing public engagement does not necessarily have to happen, um, you know, like at the end of your data collection. Some people do write um, these kind of opinion pieces um, as they do collect their data or at the onset of their um, research to short to sort of you know like um, give the heads up that you know this is this is the kind of research being um, you know like um, being sort of embarked um, on or they do it to open channels of dialogue or you could do it to build external you know like network and collaboration capacities but in either case it will give you a good base and to connect with policymakers, NGOs, or external actors that you may not usually come across in your academic audience. So it is really important that you sort of wide, so, so you, to, you sort of reach out um, um, non-academic audiences to widely engage your research um, findings or, or your, your insights. Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, like, um, about our experiences about you know writing of that pieces and how we end up you know like actually engaging with with public and diverse public audiences as well um can can i have the next slide so what is opet um what is this opinion pieces actually opinion pieces um is is different from news release it is not a news release it is not a progress report showcasing um how you know, your particular research is um is is developing, or it is not a sort of fundraising letter where you ask um, people to sort of contribute to your project, actually. It is about writing something that you have the knowledge to comment on. Um, for instance, um, if you're an immigrant, you could possibly write about the new immigration reforms, for example, taking place um, in, in the UK. Or um, if you are, a, for example, a refugee, and then, you know, like a refugee doctor, for instance, you can talk about uh, the practices about, you know, like the sort of your experiences um, in the health education and healthcare system of, of a particular country. Or if you're a woman with, um, for example, care responsibilities, you could write an op-ed piece on how the lockdown and pandemic affected you um, in a unique way that may not have affected your partner or, or, or the man. So in, on the right hand side, you will see actually um, see two op-ed pieces. The first one actually is, is an op-ed piece um, written by a woman academic talking about how um, little research time they get in comparison to men during the coronavirus pandemic. So it was written by a woman academic and it was just like her experiences of talking about how pandemic and particularly um, affected, um, affected her. And likewise, um, in the past, um, when the pandemic sort of the pandemic sort of first kicked off, I also wrote um, an op-ed piece talking about the productivity levels of women academics, that how women academics are indeed exposed to um, sort of much less research time and compared to their male colleagues uh, because of the um, unforeseen you know, like and reproductive um, labor or, you know, like all these household chores imposed on them. And you will also see, and um, the second one, um, yeah, the second one is actually written by Kunmi, and it talks about how coronavirus universities are shifting their classes online. So Kunmi is, is works on actually, is quite knowledgeable on, you know, online teaching methods 
and works on online technologies and how it can be integrated to education. So and that was an that was a piece where she reflected her own experiences about, you know, like how online classes should be uh, should be sort of uh, design and likewise in the in the piece that I've just uh, mentioned, I was talking as a feminist researcher. I was talking about my experiences, um, you know, like working with women and gender inequalities, um, and then how understanding how these gender inequalities are actually deepening, deepening um, the injustices even more through the pandemic. So, um, it should be related to something that you could comment on, something that you could um, associate yourself with, or something that you could research, or something that you have the authorization and and the knowledge to be to to, to comment on. Actually, um, can me can I have the next slide? Um, um, can me we're seeing your desktop as you move towards the um, you know mail sections when you check the mails. <laughs> Um, so what is OPET piece? Um, well, actually, the OPET piece is sort of a, a short piece. Um, it's not a, it's not it's not quite long. So it's a short piece that's between 750 words and 1,200 words, and um, so 1,200 words. So it's 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 ba it's basically you know like um, it gives you a snapshot of um, what particular topic that you're interested in. It has actually a clear message and a point of view. Um, so normally your op-ed, your opinion piece will be very straight to the point, very straightforward, um, unpacking a particular issue rather than, you know, like unpacking multiple issues. So it's always to, it's always better to narrow down your arguments. And it should um, also have a very strong and a political voice of the writer. So you should make your point very clear. As you write any given, you know, like an um, opinion piece, you you you'll probably have a position on, on a on whatever you are writing. And your position should come very clearly um, to the audience um, so that you can make your point and directly deliver your message to the um, to your audiences. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, so how how does you know like these opinion pieces work? Actually, um, first of all, you could have, it works with an opening sentence. So um, this opening sentence is usually a hundred word of a strike, of a strike, a striking induction or sort of introduction, let's say. And so it's, it is, it's very important because the first opening sentence, the first two or three sentences is your opportunity to catch the reader's attention. And um, what happens is that, you know, these kind of op-ed pieces come up, you know, like in newspapers, in online newspapers or on online platforms, um, or, you know, like as you go through your Twitter feed, news feed, you will just like see people writing for a number of um, different blogs. So often, um, it should have a sort of a really um, a, a new sort of a value in terms of catching catching the attention of the audiences. So it could be a surprising fact. You could um, start making a very bold and a strong claim. You could use a metaphor. We'll talk about this and a mystery or or a, a counterintuitive observation to present your argument. So um, if you can catch your audience within the first two or three sentences, then that means that they are more likely to read your um, opinion piece. And then it unfolds a bit like the thesis, um, you know, like, or an article structure where you present your main argument. And your main argument, of course, should be supported as you would do in a, in a research paper, examples, um, statistics, or any kind of research. And these statistics can be, you know, like statistics of anything yeah, you can get from OECD, a statistic of, um, you know, like um, of EU or, you know, like any, any anybody's. Um, it could be sort of start, um, you know, like you can support your arguments by sharing um, very updated news. Um, or you can just reports from credible organizations like, I don't know, like UNHCR could be one of them. Or you could start with the, you know, like um, the quotes of the well-known and well-established people, policymakers, academics um, in that particular field. Or you can just basically talk about your, you know, like a first-hand experience. This is because we want these opinion pieces to have a level of, you know, like a personal a subjectivity into it. And of course, you need to, as you would in a, in a research paper or, or any dissertation, you need to also talk about your counter-arguments. 
So uh, meaning that you know, if what you should just acknowledge the 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 other side or the views or the opinions of of the other side as well, and um, you should sort of um, give the base to them that you know, although I argue this and this and that, and you know, there are there are people or there's some research or there's some studies or there's some you know like researchers who would argue the otherwise, and according to them, this is because blah 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 blah. So you should just really present your counter arguments. And then you can just um, proceed to proposing a change, you know, as sort of a um, really summing up what this your argument and the, considering your argument one hand and the counter argument on the other hand, what kind of a, you know, like a change can you propose or a direction or a policy or, a, or an action. And later on, um, you can end your um, piece by repeating your argument, answer the question or the problem you have posed in the introduction as you would do in, a, you know, in your dissertation or, or in your research paper, or you can make um, an open ending by making a suggestion, or you can even make an open ending in, in some pieces by asking you know, like, um, further questions to be, to be you know, like, um, just to, um, as a teaser to, to sort of um, urge your audiences to think about the issue or you can make a close ending by you know like reinstating your your statement again and um, can we have the next slide so actually the most important thing as i've just told is the opening statements so how do you catch the attention of your reader so this is this is the most important because like most of the open pieces um is the the if you look into the, you know, like how these um, opinion pieces are being sort of um, the business of opinion pieces, let's say, um, is that, you know, if you can catch your reader's attention, the first, you know, two or three sentences, it's more likely that it will, it will get, um, you know, like um, it's a wider audience and it will be read much more um, than any other um, sort of um, news pieces. So how can you catch your, um, you know, like attention of the reader? So it's just like a bit, I put a a pot of cheese and a, and a mouse trap because it's a bit like a, you know um, just attracting your audience into into your piece. So um, there are a couple of you know techniques that you could use it. Um, so first of all, you can use a relevant news. I mean, if you are writing, for example, on um, refugees, the reason why I'm talking about refugees that seems to be you know like one of the you know um, topical issues that we often see on newspapers, then you can just like share some news titles from your know, newspapers about about, you know, like um, about refugees, or if you're talking about young people's lack of access to internet, or if you're talking about how a pandemic is affecting schooling of children, you can easily talk about the news um, that shows or um, that actually argues um, how the internet is a big problem and is deepening the inequalities between, you know, like different um, students or different, you know, like, um, you know, students from different, different classes or, you know, like how the, the poverty is, is affecting on their um, attainment, but also sort of um, determining who gets what quality of education and who gets to what extent they can reach education. Or you can just tell an anecdote, like a story. So if you are, um, for example, um, talking about the recent change in immigration policies here in the UK, you could basically say that as an immigrant woman in this country, you know, like I've come on blah, 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 blah. And then you can just talk about your experiences. Or, you know, like if you are writing on, as I said, um, as, a, as a woman academic who have really struggled through the pandemic because you had to, you know, like um, bear the, these um, child care responsibilities and the, the, the you know, like um, the household chores, you can just say that as a woman academic, I feel myself. Um, sort of overwhelmed in terms of productivity and so on and compared to my milk so it's just like giving a personal touch to it or you can use an anniversary I mean if you are particularly talking about an issue you can um, you can just say that um, today marks I don't know like the 100 years of blah blah or um, 25th year of this peace agreement or um, if you're particularly talking about any any event that you could possibly link into a date that will really make it more um, catchy for your piece. Or you could cite a measure research. And this measure research is usually, you know, like um, if you're talking, for example, um, about, about happiness um, or happiness in relationships, for example, you can talk about this measure research that's in 
done in Harvard University, um, which they a longitudinal research of uh, 90 years where they actually more than probably 90 years where they just look to generations of people understanding what really um, a happiness would, would include. And that was a really interesting study. So you could just like um, cite um, these kind of longitudinal, like a measure, um, measure research that have quite um, marked the field if, you, if it's relevant to what you're talking about. Or you can talk about a reference to a popular culture, which I find much more, you know, like slightly effective, more effective than the other, other techniques, is that, um, you know, for example, you can talk about Game of Thrones. So um, I know that now the season of <laughs> Game of Thrones has come to an end, but, um, you know, a couple of years ago, it was it was huge, um, a topical um, um, series and everyone would talk about it and you could basically talk about how Game of um, Thrones is um, you know like um, the topic that you will be talking about relates to Game of Thrones and actually a couple of days ago I wrote a very interesting piece that started um, with Emily in Paris so probably you've seen this Emily in Paris um, series some of you it was also um, it also become um, a at some point TT in Twitter. So one of them actually researchers were talking about this, um, the pandemic and the, and the culture of capitalism. And she used the example of um, Emily in Paris as a way to um, sort of present her findings and start her argument, which actually caught my attention. So when I said, oh, let's see what's, what's, what has to say about Emily in Paris and how it, this relates to her and um, to her research. So I just start reading it. So it's, it's a good strategy actually to reference uh, popular culture if you are particularly interested in and catching the attention of um, younger audience, I would say. Um, can we have the next slide? Can we? Okay, so um, what are the top tips? So I will briefly talk about top uh, the tips that, you know, like you should bear in mind. And then my friend Kunmi will just like um, take it up um, from here to talk about ethics. So um, well, the tip is that you should be timely because um, editorial sections prefer articles uh, about current events rather than something that happened, I don't know, a year ago or a couple of, a couple of I don't know, like um, years ago. So it is important that if you are writing, you know, if a particular topic, you should sort of um, um, really look for the right timing to, to, to write on that actually. So, and um, for example, in the UK currently, we're discussing about the lockdown and, you know, like the, how it's going to be eased and, and what it's going to be, you know, like, um, you know, to what extent it's going to be easy during the Christmas holiday. So if you are writing about something about, you know, pandemic and Christmas, and um, this will be, or, or the schools will be the, you know, like perfect time to talk about it. And also ask your, um, also ask yourself why you are writing that piece. So I know that we are doing all sorts of different and interesting, you know, like a research. And sometimes we are so much drawn into our research that we think it's so interesting, but it might not be really um, so relevant at the time that you are writing that piece. So you should really ask yourself, you know, like, so what? Why, you know, like one should read this piece? Um, so if you are, for example, I don't know, working on, um, just to give something from my own, you know, like experiences that um, if you're working on, for example, um, peace education, like what I do, you should ask yourself, you know, why should I write it now? So why people should read something on peace education? So you should really ask yourself and how you can possibly uh, link this peace education with um, some wider um, current issues that's taking place in our world. So these are all important things that um, you need to ask yourself. So you may have a great idea, but it might not be the right time to you know, write about it, or you need to think it really carefully um, to, to sort of, you know, like market to your audience and also to the editors. And unlike journal, uh, journal articles, you have actually, um, as I said, 10 seconds to catch the attention of readers. So get to the point. Do not wait until the end of the piece to make your argument. So make, start with a very bold argument saying that, you know, like this is, this is what's happening or pose an, an interesting question, um, you know, um, if you're writing about the EU and Brexit, and because now I think we're now going into, a, um, you know, by the end of this year, UK will be out of the EU. So you can ask, you know, like what will happen to EU migrants? So just trying to make it more catchy 
um, for your audience. And also have an opinion and state it assertively. I mean, in your thesis, um, we may want to have a more subtle language of recognizing both sides or speaking, you know, like a carefully, um, or, you know, like um, we may sometimes refrain making, you know, like very strong arguments, but unlike your PhD thesis, you have to have a very strong voice and a political voice and make it, and, you know, like put it out there. Um, and also you have to make some specific recommendations and bullet points. I mean, do not be afraid to use bullet points. Um, actually, when um, Kinmi was writing, um, I mean, I find Kinmi's um, piece on conversation about how to, um, you know, like what to pay attention when we're teaching online. She provided around 14 bullet points and that was really an effective way of communicating, you know, like um, the, the crux of the, the online learning and pedagogy is saying that, you know, do this, do that, don't do this, you know, like be aware. So, so these are really important um, ways to, to get your message straight to the, you know, like to your audience, because also remember that, um, your audience um, will not be necessarily working in your field. So they may have a different um, expertise, they may have a different research interest. So I may be end up, you know, like as a researcher, you know, of a sociology of education, I might be end up reading um, a piece on, on politics. So it should be really very sort of accessible to me. So that's why you should, for example, as I say, um, as you will see here, number eight, you should avoid any kind of jargon. And also, uh, don't be scared to give your specific examples from real life. Use your own experiences. Of course, use first person pronouns, say I, or if you're co-authoring with someone else, say we. And you can use you know, your own experiences to justify your point, because that has to be sort of a reflexive piece rather than an, 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 a well-cited, rigid academic piece, actually. And um, of course, you should use short sentences and paragraphs. So um, I know that in our papers, or if you're writing your um, a thesis, sometimes you tend to use these one paragraph long, you know, sentences or complicated and complex writing styles. But that's that's something that's that's definitely um, the editors do not want to see in their op-ed pieces. Use simple and short sentences and these, um, you know, sort of accessible as much as you can. And while you do all these, you should also acknowledge the counter arguments. So you, I mean, being assertive does not mean that um, you will ignore the other side of the story or otherwise this may not sound like a very a critical piece, but something that you are imposing your views onto the audiences. So you should always make room that, yes, though I'm arguing this, I'm aware that, you know, this is the this is the counter argument, and um, the, this counter argument, um, you know, like relies on this and this and this and that, you know, like effects. And this is something maybe we should consider. But still, you can say blah 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 and state your argument in in in, in a very sort of um, assertive way, but also making room uh, that and also showing that you have read the counter arguments and you are aware of the counter arguments. Um, so I'll just leave it to Kimi now. Thank you, Melis. All right, I'll just unpin yourself. Um, and then next slide here. Um, so, I mean, we just give you a lot of tips. So does that mean that we know, we know how to do those all? No, I mean, the answer is no. Um, I, I'm just sharing my experience with you, but by no mean that I'm, I'm doing it well. So that's why I think I want to share a couple of things um, that I have done. So before the COVID virus, I've never been interested in public engagement and writing this kind of piece was never become a, a my priority. But of course, the COVID and the online education that kind of hit. And I think that was a moment I can actually talk about my experience, which can be quite helpful. So for me, it's just like six months, the past six months that I started to interact a lot with the public communication. So I'm learning a lot at the moment. So for things on the screen, I find it quite useful to remember is that it's always good to disagree with the idea. I think um, Malice provide a lot of good tips in terms of how to catch people's idea. But when, I mean, everyone here, when do you feel like you want to talk? It's like when you hear someone saying something stupid, I mean, your senior view, and that you have urge to say something back. So that's just how it is that. So when uh, I heard a lot of people in university just talk about online education as if it's like simple tool that we can just like move everything online that should be fine during the pandemic. I was like, wait a minute, are you kidding me? 
so that's how like really I was motivated to you know what I'm gonna say something back that online education is not as simple as you guys are talking here and that should be not a simple t a uh, simple tool so that's why I did it and also that's important that's why that in my article the first article especially I wrote um in early March was all about that really trying to say something back to the public discussion and that's a really good kind of way um but of course that it's the although there are some public figures who are very known and the, who tweeted things that which is really you know disturbing but of course that it's not a good ethics in a way that we are talking back to those people in terms of engaging with their idea, but we're not going to give any personal attacks, although you may want to do it. So that's kind of first thing that we should keep in mind. And then also when you do that, you will get criticized a lot. So first article I published and then I got a lot of responses from people. Some people really like it. Some people didn't like it. Some people really hated it. I couldn't quite understand why people are so angry as so of my so like my first article is all about online education is difficult and then typical reaction I receive is like so what what do you want it's pandemic and then it's quite personally quite um I don't know I got the email kind of full and um, so uh, we have you have to be aware of like you're dealing with not um the, the, you're dealing with the people who are not like-minded. So when we publish the article in journals, you can kind of assume that who is your audience. So you can just talk to them um, in a way that you just expect their reaction quite clearly. But in this sense, no. So but that's another thing that, but you shouldn't really take it personally. I, uh, uh, to be honest, I engage in a couple of Twitter fights after my, I published third article, especially when I was talking about five different ways that online learning can enhance students' experience. And I got like involved in some yeah, conversation that some people think that online education, I mean, some people directly attack me and then I had to kind of attack back. But anyway, so that's another thing that I learned over time that I have to be open minded, uh, especially about criticism I'll get in terms of, and that's my responsibility. And then the second, third thing, I don't think that it's like very basic ethic, uh, ethic that we all kind of share because like we don't really submit the same piece to different journals altogether. I mean, we're not supposed to do that. I mean, same here. Although you think that your idea is good, but you're not very sure who is going to take your idea because pitch, doing the pitch, initial pitch, we're going to talk about in a sec. It's quite a nervous thing because you want either times high education or conversation will take it. You start to send it to over. And then it's not a really good idea because, um, I mean, you know, because like actually if they really want all of you to write it, what are we gonna do about it? But anyway, so, and then uh, so last, I'm gonna share my story about that too. So last kind of point that is respect. Um, so I think, I wrote four articles with the conversation. So first article was the only article I did my own pitch. And second, third, fourth article um, is more of the kind of editor came back to me and suggested and I, had, I was having conversation with the editor after first article published. These are kind of reaction I received, what do you think? And it was all collaborative and uh, after, after that. So I think it's really important because I often hear some academics be quite offended by editors of this kind of channel because they feel like they have the idea, but editor want them to write in a way that they don't really want to, or the editor tried to fix that. My editor was brilliant. She's very, uh, she was very respectful, but she had a really good point always. She thinks she's like one paragraph, she just removed it and she just asked me to write something else. Um, but you know, I did it. So uh, I respected it. And then I will show you one example here, which is uh, Melis nicely pointed out. So I know this is going to be shared later during your work uh, breakup room session. So don't worry, you don't have to read it. But like, just look at the left side of thing, which I wrote. So if you look at the top tips given by Melis, these are all against top tips. I started my, you know, I started right in a way that I write for a journal article. I tried to give some context. And then my point where it came all the way down, like almost middle until middle, I didn't really talk about what I wanted to say. And I was just kind of, you know, 
this is like so am my editor so i mean the, on the right hand you can see what was kind of my, my editor did for me my editor kind of took the second third fourth paragraph all gone so i wrote like 900 and they came back with 300 left and she was like you know what you have to say this, 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 as of all bullet point idea was hers. And she kind of summarized my lengthy like mumbling into 14 tips. And she's like, you know what, just have one sentence here. So for me, I just follow what she asked me to do. And then this was read more than 20,000 times. So I, I really had to say this is all for, uh, or uh, thanks to her. So my, so like, that's why the last ethic that I want to share is really respect your editor. And then it's really good to have good relationship with editor because as I told you, after that, when this conversation kicked in about whether, uh, so at, and if, and at the end of spring, when the conversation kicked, go, kicked up about what we have to do in, during summer, that was editor who'd contact me and then say, you may have something to say right now. Do you want to write? And then also this term when the, you know, October, the people, students are doing petition about, you know, getting refund of their tuition. That was editor again, come back to me. This is a current issue. Do you want to write something about it? So for me, like after having the first couple of really good experience with her, I feel like I have really good partner that uh, if I want to write something for the public, I would do. And then, um, so that's something that I really want everyone in this room to pay attention when you're working with editor. And then, so the pitch. So what are going to do about the pitch? So, I mean, I kind of shared some happy story, but no, it wasn't. Um, so what happened was, as obviously I'm Korean, so Korea got hit by COVID virus so much earlier than UK. So UK is one of the latest countries got this COVID. Um, and then um, so Korea start, it's all over start of January. So I've been following Korean news. I mean, that's just how I am. So, and I've been like looking at how Korean university was busy putting things online and they already got to the point that some fails and so on. So I was kind of following those kind of uh, publication. And then when I feel like it's coming through the UK, almost like it was halfway through the U European kind of continent. I thought that's probably time for me to kind of start and that there was conversation globally about the online education. So um, I was trying to pitch my idea. So where to pitch is a really first question that you have to think about. I sent my pitch uh, first, the, the um, Times Higher Education, because that's usually what I read and I wanted to do it. Um, but other than that, we can start think about the newspaper and the print publication, the magazine type of things and the website and blogs. Nowadays, like some of the really technical, well-cited blogs are maybe better than any other newspaper in terms of readability. And also the uh, technically speaking, the conversation is also a blog that is kind of created by academic and university to make some impact upon public but it's considered like website and blog and university websites is like because university blogs are picked up by the editors of this national and local website and blogs as well so that's really good way of kind of if you think that the conversation is just too high to begin with university blogs that they're always thirst for good the university blogs are always thirsty for the good kind of contribution. So you can start from there. And I, I learned that editors are actually paying attention to what is published from those universities. And how to pitch? Of course, you have to read the submission guidelines. So this is very similar in terms of what we do with journal submission. You have to read submission guideline a bit carefully because each each place, the, the times and um, higher education and conversation have quite different way of they want us to talk about what we want to write. So I couldn't really use the same context. Um, and have a, like have a strong opinion and write in the same thing, but you have to say something. Um, so you have to come across quite um, having some uh, really strong opinion, which is going to be interesting. And then also the in the line with character argument that you've been hearing. And you, you have to really say why you're the best person. So whether it's going to be personal experience or your um, academic interest or a pu previous publication, you have to have and current pr project have to have this, have those uh, background things to show that you're the best person to talk. So pitch is usually around 2000, uh, 200 and 300 words, which is quite small. So in the small piece, how are you going to do it? Well, let me go to 
So I'm going to just talk briefly about my conversation experience. So again, higher education, times higher education, I did that first. And then the editor immediately came back and say that they have started already working on it. So I was a little bit late because the high, uh, times higher education was they were happy to, uh, there, but they have already planned a series of publication related to topic. And then I was a bit late. So they were like, OK, maybe next time. So I had to go for the, the conversation with a similar idea. So conversation, this is conversation um, kind of a, their guidelines, which I find very helpful. But the Times High Location, for example, doesn't have any strong structured guideline like this. So I think for me, uh, although in the future I go for the other venues, I think I'll use the same structure that conversation has asked me to write. So they're really asking exactly the same thing Melis captured in terms of top tips. They want it to be really timely and the evidence-based analysis and issues. And also, you know, timeless is everywhere, you can see. So it's like really important that like, when you feel like this is a time that you have to put your voice out, it's like a thousand times easier than just normal time you try to really, you know, prove yourself. It's really difficult for you to um, really, if no one is interested in the topic, if you just try to say how it is important, it can be really easily discouraged. Um, but if it's just timely and it's just obvious COVID virus and then online learning, that was to totally obvious topic topic back then, so it was easy for me to just uh, throw my idea. And then, um, so, okay, someone is knocking on my door. I think that's Amazon. I'll try to ignore and keep going. So, um, so that keyword search, so what they really want to do is like a make connection to their previous published article. So when I tried to do it, there like the, the conversation has already like 20 different articles about COVID. Then they, they want me to really look at them, read them and make connection in my pitch. So I did that. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the structure of the pitch. So if you go on their website, actually you can just enter each of this in the system. But they want you to talk about one sentence of what is your story. I mean basically it's like your title and why it's so important. And then they gave me 100 word limit. So, I mean, it was kind of easy for me to say it, but if it's normal topic that you have, which is not timely, you may have to craft it really carefully to uh, make it more reasonably uh, important. And the key point, I have to say a few things there. And then time, timeline, yes, that's just how relevant that is, that they have, so you have multiple tools that you can choose on. And section I chose education. So this is just like, I'll give you kind of a couple of minutes to kind of read through. This is what I wrote uh, in my pitch. All right, so yeah, so basically, uh, <laughs> Melissa and I tried to come up with the poorly written um, pitch, but I think this is one of those. So I'm trying to say is that the timeless was really important because if, you know, as you read it, this is not typically well written piece. And then, so what happened was I wrote this pitch and the editor take it, I mean, she took it, she's happy for me to work on it, but she entirely say that you're, but you're not gonna write the key points that you said you're gonna write. So it was like from the beginning that I had to have a little conversation about what she thinks that um, everyone else wants to hear. 
And of course, I put my opinions in that, but uh, to talking about two other universities in Asian context, which I had some data back then, that social, she thought that that's not the one that actually everyone is interested in hearing, just talking about it more from the UK setting. Could you please do that? So I said, I yeah, of course, I'll try. So um, that was what happened there in terms of my experience. So, um, so, so kind of for the past, Kind of 45 minutes that Melissa and I kind of try to squeeze the things that we know and try to share it with you. And now we're going to get into the small group discussion for the next 20 minutes to discuss about, um, uh, just kind of have a quick look about my own initial draft article and edited final article. And if you go again, go back to some of the points Melis made is in terms of top tips. Uh, and see how my initial draft article was poorly written compared to my edited version of final article. So each group, I'll put you uh, four of you in the group and can come up with the three points about how you how they those two are different, and then three kind of three important takeaway uh, that you can get from mainly I guess the well edited version with the help of the editor. So that could be great, and I'll put on the chat, a link. If you go there, you can download the PDF file, which has the initial um, draft article. And then I have link there that you can, which will bring you to conversation site where uh, my edited final version is up now. Um, so just by, before that, do you have any urgent question? I think that Melis has been engaged with you in terms of chat. Um, I mean, we can take your questions after your group discussions if you want. We can have a Q&A session and, um, yeah, I know that some, some issues come up, like, um, you know, in the chat about, you know, the reactions of the public <laughs> that might not be always welcoming. So we can talk about, you know, um, these kind of issues or any questions after, yeah, your small group discussions. That's cool. I just wanted to, all right, get some, some time to put you in. So I'll put you everyone in I think five group. Cool. All right, so we'll send you messages before five minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll get you automatically back to the room exactly at um, 141. So all right. All right. I'll send you you can just accept the invitation and that will bring you to the room. <laughs> 